We have already heard a fair bit about carbocations, having met them as intermediates in both the SN1 and E1 reaction mechanisms. In this video, we're going to talk a little more about this type of reactive intermediate. Factors that stabilize carbocations, the capacity of carbocations to undergo rearrangement reactions, and the relationship between carbocations and other important types of reactive intermediate. So we have seen that a tertiary alcohol halide like this one might reasonably be expected to lose bromide and form this carbocation intermediate as part of an SN1 reaction, where that cation is then intercepted by a nucleophile to give a substituted product. Alternatively, deprotonation of the carbocation leads to our E1 reaction pathway and an alkene product as shown at the bottom here. Carbocations are planar. The theory of valence shell electron pair repulsion tells us that the three bonds will orient themselves as far from each other as possible, which in a trigonal system is to the corners of a triangle, with bond angles of 120 degrees. The carbocation is most usefully thought of as an sp2 hybridized centre, with an empty p orbital on that central carbon. We have previously learned that this tertiary carbocation is more stable than the corresponding primary or secondary species, because the presence of more CH sigma bonds on the carbon next door to the positively charged center means there is more capacity for hyperconjugation, which is a stabilizing effect. Carbocations can also be stabilized by resonance from adjacent pi bonds, as in the allyl and benzylic systems here, or from lone pairs on atoms such as nitrogen or oxygen adjacent to the positively charged carbon centre. It also follows that inductive effects can stabilise or destabilise carbocations. In this example on the right of the slide, the presence of three highly electronegative fluorine atoms on the carbon next door to the C plus will pull electron density away from the already electron deficient centre and destabilise that carbocation compared to the equivalent species which doesn't have the fluorines. Now let's take this a little further. Given that more substituted carbocations are more stable, it turns out that carbocations are prone to rearrange via bond migration reactions like this one, where a hydrogen moves from one carbon to the carbon next door, turning a secondary carbocation on the left into a tertiary carbocation on the right. We've not really seen a reaction like this before, a rearrangement is an intramolecular reaction, that is, it occurs within the one molecule and sees the bonding reorganized from starting material to product. The secondary carbocation on the left has rearranged to form a tertiary carbocation on the right, which is more stable because it is more substituted at the positively charged center. A hydrogen atom has migrated along with the pair of electrons in that bond, so we call this a hydride migration. And because the hydride has moved from one carbon to the carbon immediately next door, this is classified as a 1-2 hydride migration. It's a 1-2 migration regardless of where in the alkyl chain the migration has actually occurred. Because if you look closely and count, you'll see that in this structure, it's moved from carbon 2 to carbon 3. Putting this idea into practice, have a look at this addition reaction of HCl with 3-methylbutuanine. Two products are formed. Looking more closely, we can see that the first product results from direct addition of HCl across the double bond, as we'd expect from our previous understanding of these reactions. Addition of the proton in the first step to the less substituted end of the alkene gives a secondary carbocation which can react with nucleophilic chloride to generate that left-hand product. But there's an alternative pathway giving rise to the second possible product. If this carbocation intermediate undergoes a 1,2 hydride shift, then we generate a tertiary carbocation. And interception of this species by chloride gives us the second product. If you want to delve deeper into this example, have a think about aspects of kinetic and thermodynamic control here. 
and ask yourself how Hammond's postulate might come into play. However, please note that these are definitely advanced topics in this context. It turns out that other groups can migrate too. This is a methyl migration, which converts a secondary carbocation into a tertiary carbocation. The methyl group is again moving from one carbon to the carbon immediately next door, so it's classified as a 1,2 methyl migration. In the context of carbocation rearrangements, watch out for cyclic systems that can rearrange to expand the size of the ring which relieves ring strain, as well as giving rise to more substituted carbocations. In this example, protonation on oxygen starts the reaction. That makes sense. That oxygen lone pair is the most available to react with H+. Loss of water as a good leaving group will give us this secondary carbocation. Now, the electrons in the bond between carbon X and carbon Y migrate to the empty p orbital on carbon Z can show it with this curly arrow. This generates a tertiary carbocation and a more stable six-membered ring, from which loss of a proton, using water or perhaps chloride as our base, gives us the rearranged cyclohexene product, completing the elimination reaction. Before we leave carbocations for now, we should take note of their place amongst other carbon-centered reactive intermediates. As we've seen already, an alcohol halide can lose bromide to leave the positively charged carbon center of a carbocation, which has six valence electrons around the central trivalent carbon atom. Contrast this to the situation where a suitably acidic proton, H+, can be removed from a carbon atom, leaving behind a negative charge. This gives rise to a species we call a carbanion. It's also trivalent, but has eight valence electrons at carbon, and so is negatively charged. Turns out it's also possible, if the circumstances are right, for one carbon atom to lose both a halide leaving group and a proton H+. This would leave a carbon that is neutral. Remember, it's lost H+, and Br-, so it will be neutral overall. But it carries a lone pair. This neutral, divalent, carbon-centered species is a highly reactive intermediate that we call a carbene, which has six valence electrons at the carbon. And let's not forget the possibility of homolytic cleavage of a bond to carbon, giving rise to a carbon center with seven valence electrons that we call a free radical. Overall, this gives us a number of different possible electronic states at carbon, with different numbers of groups attached different numbers of valence electrons, and different reactivity profiles. From the neutral molecule, which is tetravalent and has eight valence electrons, and is of course neutral, to the carbocation that we've talked about a fair bit in this video, six valence electrons, three groups attached, and is positively charged. At the other end, the carbanion. It's also trivalent, but has eight valence electrons at carbon, and is negatively charged. And then these two species in here, these reactive intermediates, the carbene with six valence electrons and two substituents, the radical seventh valence electrons and three substituents. Both are neutral, but both are also highly reactive. Well, we'll say a bit more about radicals and classes this week. Carbanions we'll touch on here and there through the course, and carbenes can wait for another day. For more about carbocation rearrangements, have a look at the second half of chapter 36 in the recommended text Clayton, Greaves and Warren, published by the Oxford University Press.